Welcome everybody to Jamstack San Francisco. It's fantastic to see so many people, so many companies participating and such a great energy in the room. Um, as Phil said, it's, it's, it's amazing to think about that the first um, San Francisco Jamstack event was just a, a, a year ago uh, and then see how, how everything has grown since then. Um, today we are around 550 attendees, um, and um, there's so many people from the from the ecosystem here, from established players like Contentful that's been talking about like decoupling the front end from the back end and building like with an API based approach for for a very long time, uh, on new players like like Sanity that were here a year ago with just a couple of founders and today's like a really established company with funding and some amazing projects to show uh, open source participants like people from Gatsby, Eleven T and Hugo that are building these uh, site builders, uh, all the sponsors that helped us make this event uh, even possible and that's building so many exciting things in, in, in the whole ecosystem. Um, and the theme for this conference is really Jamstack at scale, right? Like even the conference itself has been scaling up and, and the whole category has really moved from a, from a point where in, in, the, in the early days there were Jamstack projects like the, like, like the early Obama campaign that Harbor Reed built before the term was even coined, right? But they feel more like one-off uh, engineering efforts, right? Like figuring out, okay, if we, if we f follow these patterns, we can get better performance, better scale, and so on. But it was like very, very custom engineered. In, and today, what we're seeing is, is, is this really emerging as, as sort of an industry practice and, and as a set of tools that, that, that real companies are, are adopting, that developers have tooling around that makes it like a viable and, and an accessible best practice. In, Today, right after I speak, we are going to see Justin from, uh, from Loblaws uh, talk about using, use, introducing a damn stack in like, the largest uh, retailer in Canada, right? which is like, a big company, lots of developers, lots of real work work like, that, that relies on, on solid and robust practices that, that, that might not have been in place for this kind of, of, of approach some years ago. Um, we are going to see uh, at this conference also Teddy from, from RBI that for those that don't know them under that name are, 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 the, are the company that owns Burger King and Popeyes and a lot of these kind of businesses, right? That's also really taken this approach and said like, okay, we, we, we can use this to build everything from uh, signs that show whoppers to, uh, to, to web applications. Um, and and we've really seen this ecosystem again, right? Like grow from, from early adopters, from hobbyist developers building things to getting adoption amongst like a, a, a large part of all the major open source projects, right? Like Vue and React and Kubernetes will all be using this approach to build their public properties and their websites. The same for, for all the site builders themselves that's emerged, but also going into to anything from really large established traditional enterprises like Citrix or Cisco or um, PayPal um, or fancy brands like Nike or unicorn startups like Flexport. Uh, again, this is, this is really something that we've seen getting, getting wide adoption today across the industry. And that's why we felt like this conference should, should be about that aspect of like the, the Jamstack is really starting to to be a real thing and it's starting to scale from, from everything to small teams to really large teams and it's starting to like pro processes and workflows and tools are starting to emerge that, that makes it viable to build a large part of tomorrow's web with this approach. So um, we, most people here probably already know that, that uh, the jam is, uh, is made out of JavaScript APIs and markups, right? And that and we have this fundamental idea of decoupling the front end layer from the back end. The back end itself is splitting into all these different microservices and APIs where some are your own and some are other people's services like Stripe or Contentful or PhonoDB that, that, that you can just connect to without worrying about running them. Um, 
we try to pre-build markup, ship it directly to a globally distributed network, and, and, and then use JavaScript as the, as the main runtime in the browser. And I think a lot of the talk around this aspect, it, it tends, tends to focus a lot on, on the JavaScript layer and the API layer that's obviously been like through, through a ton of development, the JavaScript itself has evolved a lot as a language, and the ecosystem around it has, has exploded. The whole API economy has really become a real thing. Uh, serverless functions has sort of made building ad hoc small APIs extremely simple and so on. But what I want to talk, touch more about in, in this talk is sort of the markup aspect of the, of, of the Jamstack and this idea of pre-built markup specifically. Um, so another, another sort of scaling event that, that we've reached is this point where the web itself today reaches 50% of, of all people on, on, on Earth. Like we've, we've reached this point where around half of the whole population is connected in, in, in one way or the other, which is in itself a, a, a big scaling milestone. But obviously, a lot of people are connected through mobile devices and new types of devices and, and not through the traditional like desktop computers that initially defined, defined the web. Um, we're seeing today sort of the, the overall traffic on the web, sort of being a, a, a mix between like half of it from mobile devices, half from desktop devices, half from, from all over, right? Um, and when we look at, at, at all of those people that, that have come online, like probably if we look at this room, everybody has already gotten their new iPhone 11 or Pixel 4, and everybody are adopting new devices with high computational power really fast, with, um, with, with extremely advanced capabilities, really, really making this part of the Jamstack through that the, that the browser has gone from being more of a document viewer to really becoming an operating system running JavaScript and WebAssembly and so on. But while that's true and while that's really happening and while areas like these are really pushing that forward, it's also really important to remember that, that when we look at sort of the really broad ecosystem, like even the, the amount of uh, budget Android phones with a single core CPU is still like really accelerating and growing. People are buying these, right? And a lot of people, that's, that's their access point to the web. Um, how, how many here at this conference has a single core budget Android phone? That's a couple, that's a couple, but <laughs> it's not exactly dominating, right? Um, and the reality is that, 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 that for users out there, the, these devices are, are, are really important. This is like a chat from, from Alex Russell that's, that's part of the Chrome team that's really passionate about saying, like, remember that a lot of the web needs to be accessible from, from these kind of devices. And also, when we look about like, more of the world coming online, more people getting connected, of course, not all are getting connected at, at the fastest speed. Like, obviously, if you're in a place like uh, Scandinavia, where I'm from, you'll have a great connection. If you're like, in a place like the US, it might be a little less great. And if you're some other places in the world, like, just the basic fundamentals of like, what speed can you get um, might, might be very, very different uh, and might really define the experience you get when you go online. And, and of course, this whole move to, to, to mobile and to different types of devices is, is nothing new. And it's something like we started talk, like, tackling a long time ago through, through this idea of responsive design, where we started saying, like, we can no longer assume that when we have some pixel-perfect design and implement it on a web page, we know what kind of screen format it's even going to be displayed on, right? Like, we have to start just assuming that there's all these different sizes and dimensions and uh, pixel densities and so on, and start building patterns where we, where we think about, like, building for the web in a very different way than, 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 than we did back when you really just would take, like, a PSD and say, okay, we have this design, we'll implement it in HTML, and we'll then ship it to, to FTP it to a server somewhere, and, and now we have like our, our one view of, of this web page, right? Like, and we've really gone from this world of saying, OK, we have to just think about like the content first, think about the elements, and think about how they adapt to different view formats, how 
they shrink down when you view them on a, on a smaller screen and shrink up when you view it on a really humongous screen and, 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 um, and flow with the grain of whatever device you're using. And that's, of course, been, been an incredible practice that, 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 that still has lots of momentum behind it and that's been like a, a completely common. I think no one today would, would want to like, even consider building a website without thinking like responsiveness or adaptability or something into the design from the beginning. But at the same time, Sometimes we see, and, and Francis Berryman, who, who coined the term single page applications and, and who I'm extremely fortunate to, to, to work with at, at Netlify, uh, put up a blog post the other day about like, sort of where did we end up with, with, with responsive design, right? Because sometimes we're just thinking this kind of visual element to it and we're thinking, okay, we need to adapt to, to screen sizes, to pixel densities, to, to a world of devices. But sometimes it happens in this, in this way where we put a hamburger menu and then like this massive assets of, of hamburgers that, that a like, single core Android budget phone is probably not going to like and where we maybe ship like a massive JavaScript bundle for every page load that again on your iPhone 11 is just going to make everything smooth and enjoyable but that on a lot of people's smaller devices with slower network collections are, are going to fundamentally ruin the experience. And we see this when, when we look across sort of all of the web. This is some stats from the HTTP archive. Um, for those that don't know that HTTP archive, they, they sort of take these web performance tests, they, they test, take a bunch of header information and so on, and they just crawl large swaths of the web to just gather statistics on how are we doing, right? And the reality is that we're probably not doing that well, right? Like, best practices and accessibility has a lot of room to improvement. And the basic, like, the basic measurement of like, performance is just not at, at a great place. And it's in a much worse place whenever you're connecting from, from, from a region that might not have the best connectivity, whenever you're on a, an, on, on a device that might struggle more. Um, and um, and this, is, this is obviously something that over time, if we don't address it, will hurt the web and will hurt adoption, will, will make people on those kind of devices ab avoid going online on, on websites and use other forms. So how do we make the web faster? Um, so at Netlify, we've always been focusing and saying, like, how can we make it a great experience for developers to build great experience for users? And that's sort of been one of the, the angles like, that, that we saw when, when we started seeing these architectural patterns around the Jamstack emerging, when we saw these patterns around pre-building markup, shipping it to a globally distributed network, um, starting, starting to, to delegate the right amount of logic to, to JavaScript in the browser and so on, right? That, that it had these amazing potentials to, to increase the performance of site, to get the time to first byte much lower, to get something in front of the user much faster, um, to build much more um, enjoyable user experiences as well by being able to iterate really fast on the front end layer and, 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 and build uh, interactive experiences that work directly in the browser without a lot of round, round trips to servers and so on. But we also saw that, that, that without real tooling around it, it was a great promise, it was a fundamentally sound architecture, but it's not really viable for developers to work with, right? If you had to stitch everything together for every project and figure it out ad hoc. So we saw that, okay, if we can make it a great experience to build in this way, we'll make it possible for developers to give their users better experiences. And part of this was like this move away from this old sort of wild west of like, okay, you just ship some code to a server and it runs and, uh, and, and, and that's the main sort of flow. We built some tooling around deployments and so on, but it was still basically just like, going from one version of the code running to the other. And then to this kind of world where we have this whole work workflow that, that really started when, when, when GitHub took like, a lot of the open source best practices around version control and how to work with distributed versioning systems and collaborate and so on, and build an actual developer experience around that, that suddenly took it out of Linux kernel groups and so on and into the hand of, of, of lots of developers. And today it's just like, that's the standard, right? Like that's how we work as developers, right? Beca again, because the experience of it got, got, got raised a step, right? 
And what, what we and others have tried to do has really been to take that next step of saying, like, let's take this build step of like, pre-generating markup, of pre-generating something connected to this deployment universe of a globally distributed deployment environment and build the same kind of experience around it, make it equally smooth to, to connect to a Git repository, have this whole workflow, and have your end result get distributed on, on edge networks around the world, um, and start tackling like these, these performance metrics that we all know, like the, the, the first pain that requires, like that, that's so dependent on like what's the time to first byte? How fast can you get something to the browser so it can start painting anything? The first, like, sort of visually ready, that depends a lot of like what are you actually sending to the browser? How long does it actually take, like, take the browser to to get something the the user can can look at? And then this whole time to interactive that's more dependent on like how much of a dynamic runtime in the browser do you have that requires to pass JavaScript and start rehydrating elements and so on before a user can actually touch a button and expect it to do anything, right? And and for the user, it sort of translates into these phases of like you, you, you go to a URL and there's like this white page, like this, this loading element where you're just wondering, is it happening at all, right? And again, the, the, the worse your device, the worse your connectivity speed, the more critical that moment is going to be. But even on, on really fast devices, like sure, it gets faster, but the faster the devices become, the more impatient we also get, right? Because we just get used to like everything should be instant and happen now, right? And then there's like this phase of you get something in front of you, and that's sort of the moment to, to give the user an idea, the moment something shows up on the page, is this going to be useful? Or am I just going to want to jump away real fast and, and surf somewhere else? And then there's like this, la this, this last question of like, is it actually usable? Can I actually like touch things and do things and make it, make it work for me? Um, if we think about like what we're delivering when we have like that, like ideally, I hope you're all deploying to something that, that runs globally distributed and gets something into the browser really fast, but what does it get into the browser, right? It, it, it'll need to, if you want it to be really fast, it'll need to be something that's already pre-built, right? Like as soon as you have sort of this old server-side rendering set up, you typically have to give up delivering it straight from an edge node because like the rendering will depend on some data that typically doesn't live in the edge anyway, right? So we have this concept of either like a content-based page or, or fundamentally just an app shell, right? That's like pre-built markup that you give to the browser and it needs to get the, the user this idea of like, is this going to be usable? Um, and um, you can think about this app shell as essentially like having, having two build stages, right? Like there's a build stage that happens before we ship anything to the edge, right? That happens every time we, we make a change and we make a rebuild. And then that's sort of with the Jamstack approach, another build phase that happens in the browser, in the client. That's when you've gotten that app shell, you start running JavaScript, you start rendering server, like client side templates and rehydrating stuff and so on, which is sort of a, a, another build phase that's just distributed to everybody's device, right? And anything we can put into the app shell, into the server side build process is sort of moving like computation time from the client side build step onto our end, which in the end is better for the user. Um, and then once that app shell is there, we can start personalizing, we can start calling APIs, running JavaScript, getting actual information in front of users and, and, and making it uh, fully usable. Um, and with, like, when we take this approach and generate these app shells, right, like we, we're also starting to get used to this idea of we have this build step, right, we have the Git repository that's essentially a, a, a series of, of layered versions of data, right? And each of those we can sort of map onto a specific immutable deploy that we can roll back, that we can go back and, 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 and evaluate, that we can run tests against to see is this deploy actually fast enough? Does it live up to performance budgets or, or should it just be automatically rolled back? Should we test a couple of these different deploys against each other and see which performs best. Uh, with Netlify, anyone that's used Netlify will be familiar with this kind of screen that just like, gives you any deploy you've ever made, whether it's from a branch or a pull request, or whether it's your production deploys, and let you go back to any of them in time, let you roll forward, let you roll backward, and so on. Um, so the power of this build step in the Jamstack is that if, if we can do 
the heavy lifting on, gener on, on generating the mockup, if we can take all our content and fetch it from an API during build time, build out all the HTML pages up front and make sure they already have like everything that's, that most users will care about, then we take the, the heavy lifting that would otherwise be done either at runtime by, by server-side rendering and, and slow things down to, to before people even get anything um, after the time to first byte, or we'll, we'll have to delegate that work to the user's device after everything is, is after the initial like, time to first byte has happened, right? So the power of the, of the build step in all of this is that it give us, gives us opportunities to take processing time out of the actual request and pull them into our, like, to, to make them our problem instead of our user's problem and use way less compute in the, in the process. Um, so if we go and sort of just look at how do we make performance better, how do we improve quality of life for, for our users and devices? Like everybody will sort of end up like with the, like with a basic set of like then there's endless edge cases and optimizing SVGs and like things you can dive into forever, right? But there's sort of a common set of performance optimization that, that, that everybody will just say that you should do, right? Like obviously like get the browser to cache everything it can between requests, right? Like when you move from one page to another. If, if, if the browser is reloading all the JavaScript and CSS and assets and images every time you, you navigate, that's, that's just going to be horrible, right? So that's like the, the basics and enable GZIP compression or broadly or image compression and so on. These are things that we've mostly by now delegated sort of to the edge networks we, we use, right? That where we have sort of this expectation that once it's pulled out there, like the, the actual the actual system that serves our page will 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 take care that that this is done properly and that we are not that that we are not doing something stupid at least. Um, but then there's like all these things around like how do we minimize HTTP requests? Can we inline some of the CSS? Can we inline some in images? Is it even good to minimize them or should we use multiplexing with HTTP two and so on? Right, where it's more much more a question of like what are we actually delivering to the user and how much can we can we make sure that what we deliver to the user is pre-built and optimized? Um, how can we minimize the, the response time from our web servers, right? Like, again, there's the, there's the fundamental constraint that if you're server-side rendering, it will take time to render, and that'll make things slower. But there's also the, the, the geographical distribution, right? Like, how can we get whatever serves a piece of content as close to the user as possible? And how can we make sure that our actual uh, HTML pages gets distributed to, to, to the edge and gets served in a pre-built form close to that. Again, both of these two steps really depend so much on having a built layer, right? It, it depends on having this opportunity to, to just automate and do a bunch of optimizations, of pre-building everything you can, of, of running optimizations against your, your images, of running image optimization and so on, in a step that happens before we ship anything to the edge and before we even like get the get the user a, a, a possibility to download something. The same with minifying resources, right? Like we should just automate those processes of minifying HTML, CSS, JavaScript, to do code splitting and so on. Again, it's, it's something that before we had in our workflow a build layer, it, just, it, it was just not viable to really do it with like manual action, right? And now we can start saying this is something that should just be best practice. Uh, and of course, just like again, minimizing the web server response time and improving latency with a CDN. Like traditionally, CDNs was something we just used for like for assets, right? Like we would delegate maybe the the JavaScript or the fonts or something to to CDNs, but we would still expect every actual request to a website to go right through the CDN and go back to some origin server where we had our actual web servers, right? And that's that's part of what we're like trying to act architecturally say that if you really adopt this Jamstack approach, you should not still have an origin server, right? Like, like if you're really pre-building the markup, you should be able to just distribute that globally to your users and, 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 and improve the latency, not just for images or fonts or JavaScript files, but for everything. In, but there's also more possibilities in the, in the build step, right? Like initially, I think people just thought about it as this like 
let's bundle some JavaScript and CSS and maybe do some image optimizations, right? And then over time, we've seen it grow, for example, to, to really often include this concept of pulling in data from remote services, um, services like Contentful that might be where all your content editors work. And at every build, we just pull in the new content. Uh, we, we make it available to the build tools, and we can build out HTML pages for it. It can, it can be services like FaunaDB that might take data from the client and, and, and store it. And during build, use that data to, to pre-fill really common paths that we know we should, we, we should use. Or it could be e-commerce services or CRMs or RSS feeds from other web pages you need information for. And the interesting thing is that we can shape and combine that data in a way that we probably wouldn't be able to do if we, if, if, if we wanted to do it purely in a, in a server-side rendered approach or sometimes even in a client-side approach, because taking data from, from three different sources, doing custom joints against them in a system that's like three disparate, like a, a, a CMS and Shopify or things like that, that might just not be viable to do at runtime. But at build time, it's not that important if it takes like 10 seconds, right? Like 10 seconds in, in, in a device is, is like you've lost everybody, but 10 seconds in a build is just it's nothing, right? So it opens up really interesting possibilities to, to combine lots of different APIs at build times in, in a way that we wouldn't be able to do at runtime. It allows us to, to transpile JavaScript. It allowed all of us to start using a lot of JavaScript features way before the browsers had implemented them through tools like Babel and so on. But it's also, in, like, it's also allowed this whole new ecosystem of, of, of languages that transpile into to JavaScript, like TypeScript has been, become a, a really well accepted standard today. And that would not even have happened if we hadn't started just thinking of this build step as a natural part of our development process. And I think we haven't even seen the beginning of, of what that can even mean in terms of what languages can do at that build step. And I know there's some founders in this space tonight that are, that are thinking interesting things about like if we, if we extend even further from like what a language can do if, if we think about there is this build phase around it. Like could it, could it provision databases during that build step? Could it run our migrations and so on just from, from, from a, as, as a part of the build? It's totally possible, and we'll see a lot of interesting movement in that space. We can do things like take C libraries and compile them into WebAssembly and ship them to the browser, and suddenly we can run Rust or C or Go programs in the browser, again, because we have this build step. We can also start enforcing guide, like guidelines on our code, on our style sheet, or even our content at, at, at Netlify, if, like, when we have updates to our documentation side and so on, we'll run them through lenders that will check for language and make sure we use the right kind of terms internally, that we are consistent and so on. Um, we, can, we can use tools at the build phase to make sure our sites are accessible. Um, there's more and more tooling that will, that will help us like, with that. Uh, and we can make performance tests against the build output and say, like, have we minimized the number of HTTP requests in the right way? Are we, are we living up to our own internal in performance budget? Uh, and, and verify that and even decide, like, do we roll out a build at all? Or do we say, like, this, this is going to make the experience worse for our users? So if we think sort of more architecturally about, like, the build layer and, and what the role is and, and why it's such an important part of the Jamstack, if we have, like, the old server-side rendered world of, of um, monolithic WordPress applications or something, right? Like every time there's a request, we'll see a lot of work done by a server. Like there's a server running every time and doing a lot of work. And then there's like relatively little work done by the browser in, in return. On the other end of the spectrum, we have like sort of pure single page applications where we'll see that there's almost no work done by the server, right? Like we just give an empty HTML file and some, some JavaScript. And it's a very powerful approach, like app.netlify.com. It's a single page application running on Netlify that's built in that way, right? Like it's, it's a, sometimes it's the right solution, right? But the trade-off here is you do a lot of work on the server and it, very, almost no work on the server. You can get that uh, app shell into the browser instantly and then there's a lot of work to be done in the browser on the other hand. But if we can take this, this like in the ideal sort of Jamstack approach, we see how much of all of this work can we take out of both the server layer and out of the browser layer and put into a separate build step that we can do 
just once for, for every update instead of once for every visitor. Uh, and how can we use that to fundamentally save on compute, to save on resources, to make the web way more performant for our end users and to build much better user experiences um, and, um, and, and, and make sure that the web really stays like the ideal platform to build on and to, and, and to consume from rather than walled gardens that, like, like app stores or, or those kind of alternatives, right? And this has been sort of one of the driving forces around the whole Jamstack approach to see like how, how can we make the developer experience of working in this way so great that, the, that, that, that we can deliver the kind of user experience that the web needs to win. So, so what's next at this build layer? Just some, some loose thoughts around that, right? Like when we started building Netlify just, just, just from the onset, and we started seeing this, this architectural approach like being there, right? And we saw like, okay, if you decouple front end and the back end, you use these different APIs and so on, you ship everything to a CDN, you could have all of these benefits. There's some people that's proven that it works, but it's been like one-off projects and very costly. We started seeing, okay, what can we do to make viable workflows, to just automate all the, all, all the repeatable stuff away and say, as a developer, you just write your code and the rest works for there. So the next pass for us is, of course, also to start looking at, in this built stage, all these things we do, if it's lending code, if it's running performance budgets, if it's generating sitemaps, or if it turns out to be syncing database migrations or pulling content and so on, what will be the common patterns around there? What will be the things that, that all the developers building with this stack ends up ad hoc improvising over and over again when it should actually just be there for them. And, and, and what are those layers where we can say, here we can all together build like viable workflows that, that automates the common steps and just, uh, and, and just makes them available as, as, as plugins or as, or as shared libraries or as shared steps in a build phase, right? So this is something that, that, that we're thinking of, and I think many others will be thinking about in the space and that we'll see more uh, around in later in this conference. So with that, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for, for being here and listening to this and for being part of the Jamstack ecosystem and for being developers and all the other roles involved in building for the web and making all of this happen. Thank you.